This is the Royal Institution in central London. It was here in the famous Faraday Theatre that Sir Christopher Zeeman became the first mathematician to deliver a Royal Institution annual Christmas lecture. That was in 1979, and Professor Zeeman's televised lectures were called Mathematics into Pictures. Well, welcome to this year's Christmas lectures. Mathematics is not quite a science, it's halfway between an art and a science. On the one hand, it's the art of proving theorems, and on the other hand, it's the universal language of science. These lectures influenced many young mathematicians at the time, as the professor looked at mathematical topics, such as the topology of knots and loops. There you are. <laughs> and now you've got to get free. Good. <laughs> so you have to press the function key first, and then log. That's right. He also looked at the properties of numbers and their links with geometrical shapes. Ready? Go. He demonstrated the maths of music. Now, what's going to happen? And the properties of waves. Now they're going together, and then they go through one another and come back. He even included some mathematical proofs. And therefore, A must be odd. As well as a few big bangs. To that mirror. <laughs> it was from these lectures that the Royal Institution's maths masterclasses for schools developed, which now take place in different centres across the UK. During his long and distinguished mathematical career, Professor Zeeman specialised in the study of geometric topology and catastrophe theory. Now aged 84, Sir Christopher still has an interest in mathematics education. In the office of the director of the Royal Institution, a group of teachers have come to meet him and talk about maths. It'll be nice to hear, what do you think is the purpose of mathematics, the nature of mathematics? Uh, the nature is to understand things better. We'd like to get a sense from you as to what mathematics teachers should be engaging with to develop their own mathematical thinking. Yes, well, I, my f main feeling about mathematics is that uh, students should be taught theorems and proofs. Theorems and proofs are the core object of mathematics. Actually, I really agree with you. Uh, I'm, obviously, I'm coming from a, a French background where um, theorems or proof are at the core of our mass education. And I do think that even for uh, younger people, even from younger people from inner city London, uh, the fact that theorem and proof is giving them a structure and mass is all about, you know, getting your thought organized, rationalizing and always applying mass, you're removing a big part of mass which is doing it for itself. While I think this is a fascinating area of mathematics, I'm not sure all my students, uh, some as young as 12 year olds, are actually ready um, to engage in full theorems and proofs. They need to have some background to reasoning before they can actually engage uh, successfully, I think, with theorems and proofs. And that needs doing, and it seems like we're almost stuck in that stage throughout high school and occasionally do touch theorems and proofs, but I agree with, with, with you, not enough. The problem in the fact that most of us as teachers are in this exam culture where we feel, I'd love to do more enjoyable maths, but I still feel that my pressure is to make results. I think it's an interesting dilemma that teachers are in about doing what they might think is more interesting maths and for fun, but my experience is that actually if you do that and push students to think more for themselves and get more interested in maths, then um, they do do well in exams, and I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive, actually. Do you think a lot of teachers aren't knowledgeable enough to move to this abstract world? That could be part of the reason, but I don't think it's the whole reason. I mean. Um, the curriculum is divided in, in very clear four categories. Where does theorems and proofs go in there? I'm sensing some consensus that people are okay with the idea of doing more theorems and proofs, but it's not quite clear how it's to be done and whether we have that sort of depth of knowledge and confidence. Uh, it's true. In selecting the theorems and proofs, I'd, 
I'd choose what, what ones which were very, uh, very appealing, uh, easy to uh, state and understand, and easy to explain completely. Do you have an example? Or? Lots of examples. Okay, let's, let's, have a, let's have a few. <laughs> there are an infinite number of primes. Okay. You assume that there are not a finite number, and uh, then you list them all and add one. It doesn't matter how many primes we have. That's not the issue. The issue is a reasoning, is a way of thinking. And I think a lot of proof is not about showing you know, the circle theorem. It's about how you organize your mind and your thoughts to make a thing that you can't refute. Yes, I've recently done quite a lot of work with students um, trying to discover some of the circle theorems for themselves but actually give a rigorous proof of them. Their proofs were not formal taught proofs. Although they were rigorous, they were uh, drawing angles in triangles and definitely dealing with generalities and not with just examples. Uh, do you think that's sufficient for them to, to come to it that way? No. <laughs> <laughs> they, they must have uh, eventually complete proofs, rigorous proofs, independent. So would you be happy for them to start in that way, exploring yes. with dynamic geometry or, or whatever? Yes, and fine, then that's fine. it should be taken on to a rigorous formal proof at the end? Yes, yeah. I think so. A proof shows that in any, any case, and that's a concept that's, you know, in itself is beautiful. The I, fact I, and, and, and I think that's a concept that teachers have to work with all the time in their classrooms. So every opportunity, uh, we're pointing out the difference between example and proof. proof. And this layer of proof and theorems needs to be there constantly, constantly. and built mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. years. And yeah. usually we touch it far too late. And coming back to Matt's point on GCC exam, oh, two questions, yeah. six points on proof. Here's how you do proof, um, is probably what's happening quite a lot. Geometrical proof can be handled in year seven and be quite formal about it. Uh, and then, when, you know, then you can build it into algebra uh, easily because they've got the idea of how you, you, know, you build a proof. But because we do very little geometry, we miss, in a way, we miss, we, we, we're missing that opportunity. I agree that you need to make it you know, appealing for everyone, but then sometimes those, those things different will make it appealing. Sometimes making them get out of their world, which is not always a nice place, will make it appealing for them because we you know it's beautiful to be lost in algebra. Okay, maybe not for everyone, but... Uh, and you don't have to worry about the words. You know, you've got, you're in your own little world of itself. You manage to do things. You learn new things. Just a sense of achievement of actually understanding yes. a piece of yes. math. And also doing something abstract, something that is not related to a world you might not really enjoy or like. I 100% agree with you. I think it's fantastic what you're saying. But I think we, we have a lot of teachers who haven't got the confidence or the skills mm. to do that yet and to get students to that point. How many times have you heard the question, why am I doing this? What's the point? When am I going to use it? And I'm very interested oh. in, the, in the conversation we're having. It's brilliant for one or two percent of... No, I, I embrace that conversation. I, I love it when they say, why do I use that for? It happened to well, me I do. last week but when on CERT. If I'm honest, sometimes I worry and I think, oh, I can scratch my head and I will give them an answer. But they're asking when will they use it or not when can one use it. And that's yeah, but the subtle were... difference. Of... So how do we get a whole generation of teachers and students to get comfortable with that? Do you have some solutions about how we can get teachers engaging with this sort of approach? Well, you have to find a, a subject which is, <coughs> which is playable. So you have to, have to, and then you exploit the play area. And generally, the, there's some sort of a surprise to it. Well, some students do have the talent to, to grasp all this rule, to generalize properly perhaps to root out their own misconceptions very early yes. and they're ready to play with yes. theorems and proofs and other, other yes. things and some may not and us as teachers in the classroom we have to cater as well for those who cannot. Yes. We're also trying to break down time. the barrier of years of the sort of the dentist theory of you go to a maths lesson, maths is done on you or to you mm -hmm. You leave, like going to the dentist. People don't want to go to the dentist because they don't like it. And that's 
the sort of the theory, yeah, that's, that's the problem. I think we've, it's just so ingrained now with lots of students at school level that their parents say they don't like maths. I've been to hundreds of parents' evenings where the parent says, I never like maths. You don't like maths, do you? And they say it to their child, they say, no, I don't like maths. And you think, oh, they're such a good mathematician. Or they could be. They just got this trigger in their head that says... It's definitely a social... There is a social... And no, there's also no. a high-stakes game, so you can't introduce the play too much. Because there's so much, it is, you know, it's there on every testing regime, you know, numeracy, literacy, what are they coming out with? So well, I think you've got to have the confidence to do that, because I, I firmly believe that if you do give children opportunities to play with mathematics, you won't damage their um, assessment at the end of it. But I think you have to be a very confident teacher to believe that. At the same time, and exactly, that. exactly what you said. About, I love the dentist, I've never heard it before. Uh, <laughs> but... but no, what, what, one thing they've noticed, and I've noticed it, because when you do maths and you play, I play with them. Mm -hmm. So, and I say, who wants to mark mine? Who wants to look at my answers? Because mm -hmm. a lot of time what the kids said is, how are you doing maths as well? Because they see sometimes the teacher as the one telling them, or being the dentist, doing things to yeah. them, but they don't see us play. And if they see us enjoy it, you know, when I was doing the search, I was like, oh, who's going to beat me? And suddenly they were like, you're doing it. You, and I was like, yes, obviously, because, you know, and suddenly it built a confidence. And I think that one of the things is that they don't see sometimes mass teacher enjoying the mass mm. and doing the mass. And, 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 and that's part of the enjoyment. If you play with them, if you a part, not a facilitator, a part of the game, yeah. uh, then that's part of where you see, yeah, I am a, I'm having fun. Uh, you know, you are you know, you having fun, I'm having fun, and they can see it as an adult thing as well. Following on on your idea that you're doing maths as well, bring an idea to the class and take it wherever it goes without you putting a five minutes lesson plan uh, into it. So just bringing um, a question into class and um, exploring it together with the children, giving them the notation that you, actually you're exploring with them and I've done that in some of my classes. Sometimes I go in with a problem that I don't have the solution for. And all I have to have is the competence that I will be able to take it forwards with my students as far as they can go. Leading them, exploring something together through a discussion, which leads them to generalization of mathematics, which will get them ready for theorems and proofs. I feel for an English teacher or history teacher, and this may be my ignorance speaking, it's easier for them to engage with the doing and the challenge and the play. You know, during the summer they can go to a play and, and take in a new novel. For mathematicians, we make it a lot harder. I mean, you seem to be quite engaged with playing with your children in classrooms, but some of the teachers find it very difficult. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I know that in the master classes you have engaged with students and with teachers and everybody's sort of playing on the task together. Yes. But when you started in mathematics, was it the play that got you in? Or? I emphasize on the play. Okay. Yes. If you stick always to the theory, then no damn good. <laughs> <laughs>